Well, with this, it is time for me to move on to our next panel discussion. While the consumer presence across multiple touch points has highlighted the importance of omni-channel marketing with the focus on the integration of branding, messaging, and online and offline touch points. The challenge for marketeers in this scenario as consumers move down the sales funnel is enabling a seamless customer experience. While discussing this uh, further on the topic, we're looking at winning brand trust in Omni First World is our next panel discussion. Well, with this, I'd like to welcome our session chair, Vivek Bhargava, co-founder of Profit Wheel, and also our panelist, Deepa Krishnan, Director of Marketing Category, Loyalty and Digital Tata Starbucks. We've got Mohit Rati, AVP Growth and Marketing Porter. We've got Sridhar Harihara Subramanian, the Senior Director, Digital Experience Solutions, Salesforce India. We've got Somastri Bos Avasti, the CMO of Godrej Consumer Products Limited, and we've got Vipin Nair, CMO of Malabar Gold and Diamonds. Well, with this, I'd like to warmly welcome all our esteemed panelists. Thank you for joining us. And it's so great to have uh, the you know, insights all this while so far from all our leaders. And I'm looking forward uh, to our session chair, Vivek, to take for this mammoth task of now curating this wonderful panel discussion, which we've been waiting for. So Vivek, firstly, thank you so much for your time and agreeing to be the session chair. It is time for you to take your expertise forth with your panel. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Bhavna. This is a very exciting panel and very much need of the hour. So what we're going to do is that we're going to just ask all the panelists to give about a two-minute monologue on what their take on the topic is, and then we can go into a discussion and question answers. So maybe the way I can see it from my screen, we start with you, Vipin, your take on the topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, so much for having me over here. Um, it's a great honor to be part of this event and speak to such a knowledgeable audience. So I think when you talk about brand trust uh, in the jewelry space, um, as all of you might imagine, trust is integral to doing business. Um, uh, you know, jewelry in India has not been something uh, that has just had ornamental value, but it also um, has financial value. You know, it's a wearable investment. And uh, it also comes with a, a deep sense of heritage, culture, uh, your uh, family and friends. A lot of this has an influence on the jewelry that you uh, purchase. And um, um, gaining consumer confidence, therefore, you will see is uh, the, at the heart of all uh, con you know communication from all the brands. And I think um, uh, sustaining a successful business uh, in the jewelry space, you ha you cannot do it without you know having a great amount of consumer confidence. Um, this is also borne out by a number of consumer research studies that we've done over the years. Uh, and each and every one of them trust is the biggest driver of consumer preference uh, for any brand. Um, and I think in the jewelry industry, it's also um, the other thing that we have to keep in mind is that um, at various points of time, you know, jewelry plays a very vital role at various uh, occasions in our life, you know, from the birth of a child to the time that you get married uh, to small events and occasions like uh, birthdays and anniversaries, jewelry is a part and parcel of all of that. So what you have uh, in the jewelry space is that, um, you know, the combination of these factors, that is um, A, the you know, the milestones in life are signified by jewelry. Uh, secondly, the high share of disposable income that it commands in, uh, you know, in how a family spends its money or saves its money for that matter. And the fact that it's a financial asset that can sustain you in bad times. This ensures that uh, building trust and related communication becomes paramount in the scheme of things. Um, and I think, uh, there is absolutely, uh, you know, see, if you look at any brand, you rank them from uh, top to bottom, you'll find that there is a direct correlation between the brand, uh, uh, how the brand has performed on the sales front, and also how the trust, uh, the, the, the amounts of trust that they have been able to evoke in the minds of customers. So I think, uh, as far as uh, yeah, Malabar is concerned, I think uh, our communication, a lot of it is centered around, uh, you know, driving uh, trust related communication and uh, addressing various consumer pain points, which uh, are barriers to having this uh, trust. Oh, absolutely, Vipin. I think uh, basically India is one of the largest consumption uh, countries of gold in the world. And uh, also like my own personal example, if I invest in different companies as an angel investor or a 
invest in mutual funds or anything else, like my wife has no problems of me selling it whenever I want. But if I bought gold, <laughs> then it has to be kept for the rainy day. And that's the integral part of our culture that I think it plays a very important role and what Malabar has done in the communication field of trust towards this yellow commodity is just phenomenal. So awesome, over to you, Deepa. I would love to have your take on the topic. Hey, good evening, uh, Vivek, and good evening to everybody who's uh, tuning in. Welcome to Starbucks. We always hear when you come into our stores. You know, so I'd like to start with what the vision of the brand is. For Tata Starbucks, it's about inspiring and nurturing the human spirit, one person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. And I think it's pretty simple. Uh, to my mind, whatever you do, irrespective of the various touch points that you have, you have to stay true to you know, your vision. So you can't have a different manifesto for omni-channel and another kind of manifesto for the offline. Uh, therefore, omni-channel or digital is just another medium through which you communicate the same values that your brand stands for. And that's the way we kind of look at it. So for us, it's about ensuring that you're there at every touch point that the customer wants you to be in, but making sure you don't lose the essence of your brand, uh, whether it's digital or offline. So really for us, the challenge is how do you translate the offline experience online? And you know, maybe I'll talk about that a little more. Uh, and I'd also like to say that, you know, probably end um, with a quote by Maya Angelou, the famous African-American poet who once said that people may forget what you said to them or did for them, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And I think iconic brands make you feel special in each and every interaction. So it's not really about trying to uh, purposefully build a certain, uh, you know, feeling with the customer. It goes back to your vision and translating that across all touch points. Thanks Deepa. So I'll share a personal experience today. So I had a cold brew from Starbucks on my way from Delhi and very interesting thing happened, right? So when I went to the Delhi airport, every time I get logged off my app. So the person who was serving me the coffee, he said, what you do is just take a photograph of the QR code and just store it. So yeah. then you keep the app all the time to log in and then pay from the app. So I found it very fascinating that a person who's serving me in a physical outlet is yeah. giving me an advice that actually solved my problem for the rest of my life, right? Because I can just keep the stored image and I can always scan it and order coffee. So it's a wonderful experience dealing with brands like Starbucks on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what I'm talking about. Omnichannel actually means that, that Absolutely. even the physical person who's serving you coffee can give you uh, advice and I'm supposed to be digitally literate. And still, I didn't know this could be done and it would solve my problem. So, you know, you're absolutely right. Because at the end of the day, it boils down to connections, right? Many times we forget that digital experiences are also about connections. And I think the example that you gave wonderfully illustrates that point. Absolutely. So over to you, Somashri. Would love to have your views. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for having me over here. Uh, well... Godrej, as you would always, uh, you would all be aware, uh, has been touching consumer lives across whether it's Almira's locks, etc., right up to every you know personal care uh, item to hair colors to hand washes to everything that can be there. And yes, this is one brand that has always stood for trust and a trust which has been delivered by the consistency of the quality that has been delivered by the brand throughout, right? Um, the real, real key to the consistent growth that we have seen has actually, and being relevant to the consumer, remaining relevant to the consumer, has really been about keeping the ears to the ground to listen to the consumers, understand their changing needs, and then cater to those needs. And when you do that in the best possible way to the consumer, with the best quality, with the best price, et cetera, served, that's when people start trusting your brand, right? So if I have to give an example over here, one of the best ones and the most renowned brand that all of you would at any point of time have used in your lifetime would be Goodnight, right? Goodnight, if you think about it, right from our childhood days where we used Max to evolving to liquid vaporizer, where we as a company innovated and brought in the power booster switch when we heard consumers saying that, hey, refills are great, but then, you know, during the evening when there is a lot of mosquitoes, actually nothing works. So we made the machine with a switch where you can turn it off when mosquitoes are a lot. Now that was the, just the starting point. And after that, a plethora of innovations. 
you know, the most uh, interesting one was actually massifying a benefit of, you know, how you can protect yourself against mos mosquitoes at just one rupee by burning a paper, a jumbo fast card. You just burn a paper and you get relief from mosquitoes. So some of these innovations which have not been brought home, not just been brought home, but brought home at a price that consumers can afford. The best, best example that we have is first of its kind in the world was actually in the last two years when the world needed and actually the importance of hygiene really came up. And that's when we came up with hand wash, which was, you know, a powder form which you mix with water and becomes a hand wash. What was the benefit of this was hand washes when people needed it across the strata, across rural villages, but they couldn't afford it, right? This particular world-class innovation ensured that it came at only 15 rupees, which is less than one third the price. So these were the kind of innovations which actually build the brand trust because you're bringing in the benefit that consumers really need at that point of time. Uh, but is it only about massifying? No. I mean, you, we are all aware that, you know, all products are now omni, uh, present omni-channel. And hence, how do we cater to the needs of even the premium consumers? So in fact, we also, Godrej, I would say, actually capitalizes on these opportunities really well. So we have specific innovations which are meant for only e-commerce as a channel, right? A premium kind of air freshener, which you can operate through your mobile phone. So our Air Smartmatic, it's a premium product and you can control the spraying with just a mobile phone. And this is meant for the consumers who are willing to pay that premium, customized to their needs. So yes, these are the kind of things which as you, you know, keep listening to your consumers and their needs, you keep on providing them, keep on serving the consumers, listen to them, keep re being relevant and keep building the trust on the brand. Thanks, Soroshi. Uh, may I request all the panelists to just keep themselves on mute uh, when uh, they're not speaking? So I'll share with you, Sonashi, one of the examples. I had worked with Godrej almost 20 years ago for Real Good Chicken. And they were the first ones to let us innovate on, there were certain myths about, you know, frozen chicken and something which is fresh. And we had built this thing called Mythbuster. So all our ideas, I think Godrej was most receptive for implementing those ideas. And that's what makes Godrej a very innovative company. And even 20 years back, they were willing to innovate on digital, which is just great for small agencies like us in those days to sort of <laughs> get our ideas across to brands. Uh, what do you, Sridhar, would love to have your views? Yeah, thanks, Vivek, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to be here along with all my esteemed panelists. It's already been a very uh, interesting discussion just with the opening uh, remarks. And uh, I'm happy that we're discussing this, you know, extremely relevant topic of uh, trust especially in this you know, digital age. So I work for Salesforce, uh, which is you know, known as a leader in the CRM space. But let me tell you, you know, trust is our number one value, right? It's something that you know, we published and all employees are required to know at least you know, what our four values are. But our number one value is trust. And you know, we obviously take it very seriously. Uh, and you know, being in the business of uh, helping our clients manage customer relationships, I think you know, we've learned a thing or two about the importance of trust in maintaining and nurturing those relationships you know, with customers over time. Uh, how do you build those intimate relationships so that ultimately you know, the business of delivering great customer experiences can actually be possible, right? Um, but coming back to trust itself, I think you know, I look at it as a sort of a, you know, what I call as a suitcase word, right? I think it has uh, multiple facets to it. Uh, it has connotations about uh, privacy, integrity, uh, transparency uh, and, and so on, and and you know all of them you know ultimately make up trust. And some of the you know panelists have also pointed about you know that uh, ground level you know connection that the associate has with the consumer and the innovative products and so on and so forth, right? So I feel that you know trust is you know, absolutely you know paramount, and uh, you know consumers today I think they expect a great deal of personalization especially from many of the brands that, you know, uh, are represented on this panel. But uh, I think, you know, they, they also want companies to know them, to serve them, to help them, to engage with them. But I think they also understand that there is a value exchange uh, that they have to get into with the company, right? If I part with some data with you, uh, and if I know that you're going to use the data to do something meaningful, and uh, that is going to result in some insight that you will gain and deliver a better experience to me, 
consumers are you know more than happy to you know provide that information to you so i think it's really up to uh, the companies and the brands to sort of you know understand what that value exchange is for their specific you know set of uh, consumers and uh, you know use that data in a in a in an appropriate manner right and i think you know companies who've done that consistently over time they are the you know really you know they are the ones who really win out and you know many of them are again as i say are represented on this uh, you know panel and i think you know iconic companies you know they figure out wait i mean they are not iconic uh, for you know any other reason other than the fact that they are long lasting they are you know really trusted they are popular they are beloved brands but i think at the heart of all that is again the you know the value of trust that they've established you know with their consumers and uh, you know the extension to that of course is that um, it's not just about you know gaining more sales or improving the lifetime value of those consumers i think they also become you know brand advocates and loyalists and evangelists for your brand right and i think the value of that uh, i'm sure all of you know is much more than just the pure monetary value that has resulted in buying your products or services so i do believe that you know trust is at the heart of it and uh, we of course in salesforce you know we try to put trust in uh, every one of our products uh, it is designed around you know uh, how trust is uh, you know earned and uh, respected and valued and because you know a lot of companies are trusting their mission critical data with us and, and therefore we we have to there are really no two ways about it right we have to protect it and we have to ensure that you know it is used appropriately and you know we give back customers you know what they are looking for from us so thanks yeah that's that would be uh, absolutely uh, sure i think when you were talking i realized that the trust that a consumer or a brand has even with their banking system the trust with 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 salesforce has to be even much more because the thing is if something gets compromised that you only lose some money in the bank but when you're talking about customers you lose everything that the company stands for so absolutely i can i can imagine how much trust plays a role in the success of building the iconic brand called salesforce Right. Uh, over to you, Mohit. Uh, love to have you. Thanks, Vic. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Uh, great to be part of such an esteemed panel. So, uh, amongst all the brands that we have spoken about, Porter is one of the youngest brands, right? And uh, we started uh, about seven years back, and uh, uh, it's only in the last couple of years that you know we have really uh, grown and expanded. So. you know one of the values internally that we have at porter is integrity we have five values and that's something that we uh, really hold very close to the heart uh, when porter started the whole uh, the whole ecosystem of the intercity logistics itself was deficit there was a lot of trust deficit right i mean there was no other platform which really existed in that uh, a partner or in our case a driver partner that did not used to get money on time a uh, customer would not know whether the goods will get delivered on time and there was no one uniform uh, platform of sorts which would could which could deliver goods from one place to another uh, in such a seamless manner right so we had to do a lot of work on that side in order to you know solve for that trust that hey we will be able to deliver it one of the motto our motto internally now is that uh, whatever is the deliver whatever come is the delivery will do it right i mean uh, आपका डिलीवरी है तो हो जाएगा राइट आई मीन दैट्स दैट्स द मोटिव दैट वी लिव विद वेदर इट्स अ स्मॉल थिंग वेदर इट्स एज स्मॉल एज अ पीस ऑफ पेपर टू एज लार्ज एज अ यू नो यू आर शिफ्टिंग योर कंप्लीट हाउस वी डू एवरीथिंग राइट एंड द द रीजन वी हैव बीन एबल टू डू इट एंड आई थिंक सम ऑफ इट इज ऑलरेडी बीन हाइलाइटेड बाय अ लॉट ऑफ पैनल्स मेंबर हियर इज दैट आई बाय लिसनिंग टू द कंज्यूमर्स राइट एंड इन इन माय माइंड whether it's an omni channel or whether it's a single channel right i mean the basics remain the same right you go back to your customer to you listen to them you understand what is it that they are trying to say and you you you, you solve for that right and uh, once you are able to do it consistently you deliver your promise right what you say and what you deliver actually you are able to match it consistently over a period of time right uh, is when you are able to actually uh, build that trust so uh, you know in my mind that's that's the most central piece is uh, of course there are other nuances to it um, right like how what do you do with data how how are you personal like able to personalize it what is the kind of innovation that you are able to do all of these do play an important role but you know be able to uh, deliver for what the customer is asking for what really is the need and be able to do it consistently is what uh, in my mind 
uh, has helped us and uh, is able to solve for the crust. So, also Mohit, not only Porter is the youngest company, but you seem to be the youngest panelist in this <laughs> group also. <laughs> and I think what you said is so right that trust in Porter's case, like if you're, let's say, helping somebody move a house, it's not the cup that broke, but there's so many emotions attached to that cup that is impossible to know the value of it. So it's very, very critical that a brand like Porter delivers that trust. So I'll just give you my two lines. For me, trust is always been a product and uh, basically says that uh, a great product does not need advertising. And we can say that about the first iPhone required no advertising and iPhone 13 requires plastering all over the country and all over the world. But more importantly, I think what I look at it is that Omnichol is about trust about every single interaction that you have. What I gave an example with Starbucks or some of the examples we see, there's one interesting experiment I wanted to run that let's say you cut the sofa in a reception of a big company and the CEO is going to walk in, make sure the foam is coming out, et cetera. Somebody's going to get fired. But if the similar experience a consumer has on a website or on the app, I'm not sure the CEO or the board has the same reaction. And it's quite interesting to note I was talking to somebody, there are probably hardly any companies that have people who are Mohit's age in the board. So I think the average age of a board in India will be 55 plus. And there's not a single 35 year old person. So you're building a sort of an omni-channel company, then I think diversity on the board also is probably a very important part. And I always believe that a special treatment needs to be given to certain customers. Uh, even though we would like to give the same experience to everybody else, but 20% of our customers give us 90% of our profits. So understanding the psychographics of the customers and making sure that the journey is like the airlines do it very well. So it's uh, Rajesh Jain talks about this velvet rope marketing where a velvet rope needs to be given to them. And I think understanding that in the web 3.0 world is going to get more and more critical. So the way I look at it is that I think the organization is shifting uh, because web 2.0 is becoming a 3.0. We are talking about not digital marketing anymore, but Sridhar mentioned digital age. So we're living in a digital age. And I think we have this wonderful panel today who's going to share experience in case studies, how their organizations have been able to make this transition and build trust in the omnichannel world. So I'm looking forward to this exciting discussion today. Uh, we're going to start off with you, Sridhar. Uh, I think the biggest challenge a lot of brands face is that how do you build this 360 degree experience across all channels for customers. And I think Salesforce has definitely been a, a person who has a company that has provided solutions in this space. Would love to know your thoughts on the topic. Yeah, we absolutely you know, believe that having a, a 360 degree view of the customer um, is actually fundamental to you know, delivering great experiences. But, you know, but more importantly, um, you know, in this uh, sort of digital world, you know, there are a plethora of, you know, touch points and channels that the customer has, you know, adopted and that makes the job, you know, even more difficult and uh, therefore really having a, a holistic view of the customer, you know, becomes, you know, really, you know, very crucial to delivering those experiences. And, um, you know, the, 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 the problem, of course, is that, uh, you know, the number of uh, channels keep increasing every day. And customers are tech savvy and they sort of, you know, start adopting these things uh, with respect to what delivers, you know, benefit to them, right? Um, if I want to know the status of an order, uh, why do I need to, you know, call a contact center, some 800 number and wait for 10 minutes uh, when I can just, you know, open up my, you know, WhatsApp on my phone and, you know, uh, you know press the order number ID or something and get a response, right? That's all I, I want to know. Where is it, right? So, you know, and again, you know, consumers have really figured out uh, what works best for them. And, and of course, you know, uh, given all the technological innovations, you know, that are happening around us, they, they have, you know, plenty of choices. So the challenge for, I think, you know, brands and companies is really that, you know, they have to be omnipresent, you know, they really have really no other choice, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, that omnipresence means that they need to be wherever their customers want them to be, right? That's, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, and uh, therefore, um, it, it is essential for you to be there so that, you know, you can understand who they are, you can get to know them better, you can serve them, you can engage with them and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but let me just sort of describe how we do this in Salesforce with a, a sort of a real world example. Uh, we are proud to really, you know, partner with, you know, Titan, which is, you know, India's obviously most iconic and, you know, household, you know, sort of uh, names. And, 
what we've been you know doing for the last couple of years with them is to actually establish a unified you know sort of a customer engagement platform with them right uh, what it means is that you know uh, ultimately when rolled out this is in about 350 stores you know across the network but ultimately this will be available in every single store of every you know titan brand right it could be with tanish it could be you know fast track and so on and so forth and anytime a, a prospect or a customer walks into a Titan store, um, you know, a relationship officer is going to collect some basic KYC type of data into that Salesforce, you know, platform, right? It, there, is, there is actually an application that we built and uh, which will be on an iPad and, you know, they will collect that information, right? So, and then once that sort of journey starts with that customer, all kinds of, you know, interactions and responses Maybe the customer may have called you to say, I want to cancel an order. They had a problem with something. They want to return it, exchange it, or they had an inquiry. Any kind of, you know, interaction with that brand ultimately will get recorded and will find its way into this, you know, heart of this platform, which is essentially nothing but a customer data platform, right? So this will essentially start becoming that single view of customer or what we create as a golden record of the customer, because you could have different, you know, personas, right? You could be, you know, Vivek B on Facebook and, you know, Vivek Bargo on LinkedIn and, you know, something else on Twitter, but we know that ultimately you are the same person, right? So using AI and other, you know, fuzzy logic type of stuff, we essentially rationalize it and make sure that, you know, all that information is consolidated into a compact form in that data platform. And then that data is then made available to anybody in the company that needs it, right? You could be a marketing person designing the next promotion, you could be an e-commerce merchandising manager trying to look at what kind of you know audiences I want to target. You could be a customer service person trying to resolve a problem. But ultimately, even though you look at it from your own business's lens, you're looking at that customer you know with exactly the same information that everybody else has access to, right? So this essentially makes it easier for the brands or the companies to hopefully you know put up a single face of that brand because that's what consumers want, right? I don't care whether I go to your store, I bought online, I would want to you know, be able to return it to the store, right? I don't care whether you belong to a different function and they belong to a different business unit, customers don't care about that. And I think that's what we you know, enabled. And of course, you know, we work with a lot of other companies, but you know, this is just a simple way of explaining you know, how that 360 view is achieved. And that of course, you know, has yielded a lot of great benefits to, you know, to Titan as a brand as well uh, in, in delivering those experiences where, you know, the lines between, you know, physical and digital are really blurring today. And I think, you know, this becomes a very fundamental capability that, you know, a lot of companies will require going forward. So, absolutely, Sridhar. And for the benefit of the audience, I'm joyful Vivek on Instagram. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> so, but, you know, actually what you were saying, and I was just thinking about it, I think not only for Titan as a brand, but I think this kind of a single customer view of all the customers actually can help the larger group also because right. for a person to expand your new businesses, what happens is all this data can come together and they can launch new businesses more effectively if they are able to capture the single view of the customer. So I think I'm sure that just the larger group itself, they must be getting a lot of benefit for what Salesforce has done for them. So next over to you, Deepa, I think uh, Starbucks has had sort of a very awesome transition from an offline world to an omni-channel world. Uh, pre-COVID to post-COVID, but I think would love to hear about the journey and how Starbucks has done this so effectively. Sure, Vivek. So I think Starbucks uh, was one of the brands which pioneered the third place concept. The third place is that place which is not your home, not your office, but another place where you can be the best version of yourself, think, ideate, meet friends, uh, go out on a date with somebody, etc. Uh, and therefore, for a brand like ours, when, you know, when COVID struck, we had to really make agile shifts to be where the customer wanted us to be. And we then said that we have to embrace and actually, you know, establish our leadership in the fourth place as well, which is digital. Uh, so how did we do that? I think one of the big things was customers said, can you, you know, serve coffee at home and give us the same experience at home? that we have in store. So we actually ramped up our delivery operations. We invested in new packaging and uh, the movement has been significant. Pre-COVID delivery was about four to five percent of our business. Today it is anywhere between 15 to 17 percent of our business. Um, and we made sure that we were able to give the same experience in terms of fantastic product quality, customization, personalization, etc. 
Uh, the other example is, you know, a, a snippet of what you experienced. We have something called mobile order and pay, where you can order your beverage around 100 meters from the store, you know, place your order and in our 10 minutes go and pick it up without even having to wait in the line. So various ways in which you can just enable the customer to have a fantastic experience. Contactless ordering, and that's, I think, what you witnessed in one of the stores that you talked about today. Um, things like having our merchandise, which is, again, a great way for customers to show their love for the brand and experience their fandom. Uh, you know, we were very strongly present on e-commerce uh, during the pandemic and present on multiple platforms. So today, if you're living in Patna and you don't have a Starbucks store there, you can actually have our merchandise delivered to you, right? And also formats. So we, in fact, launched our first um, drive through in Zirakpur near Chandigarh uh, during the pandemic. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of changes happened in the organization to be really where the customer wanted us to be. Uh, it also mandated changes in products. So some of the things that we did was ensure that we had subscription models for coffee so that you could have your favorite Kenya or India State Blend or Sumatra delivered to you at home. It also meant that our beverages had different formats that we offered them in. We started offering beverages in one liter packages so that you can have it you know, with your family uh, instead of uh, coming to the store for one beverage a day. So it, mean, um, it meant that we had to make a lot of these changes, but I want to say that fundamentally we made sure that the Starbucks experience translated and remained the same across. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how we did that. On delivery, for example, we made sure we had personalized notes from our barista. So if you're a cold brew fan, you know, and our barista knows that Vivek always likes cold brew, there'd be a special message from the barista to you and also, you know, urging you to stay safe uh, during the pandemic, during the height of the pandemic. And also on social media, it was so important to have that sense of connection alive. There was a point in 2020 where for three months, our stores were completely shut. Customers couldn't come to our store and they were really hankering for that, uh, for their coffee, for the, uh, you know, the, the chance to meet people in the store, the chance to interact with baristas. And we started an entire campaign called Reconnect with Starbucks, where we had personalized voice messages dropped into the DMs of our customers, calling out their name and calling out the name of their favorite beverage. So an iconic offline ritual, when you walk into a store, you have a tall, tall cold brew for Vivek, was something which then popped into your DM, and that's how we kept the connection alive. So it's, it was something, just to sum up, I'd say it um, made us rethink about formats, a product made us rethink also about the way we connected with our customer on social. And all of this thing has had an interesting uh, uh, flip side to it as well, which is that our offline sales today is so strong because we didn't let that connection slip up during these last two years. So actually, Deepa, I'm, by the way, I'm not a tall cold brew guy. I'm a venti tall cold brew. <laughs> <laughs> more part to you, more part to you. <laughs> But you know, the, the interesting part is like I live in this building called Chetana Towers. We actually had a Starbucks for a day during the weekend. And it was so awesome that all the building members got together. We had coffee together. And a lot of people we had not met for months, right? So it was just an amazing thought process that is just not, may not be commercially that viable, but it was just that we were able to all get together and Starbucks came to us. And it was an awesome experience. And, and I think also the choice, right? Because like I like cold brew with my daughter is crazy about strawberry frappuccino. And the thing is that almost all the generations are getting exposed to it. And, and, and I love this idea of actually going into a building with Starbucks and allowing us to meet our friends again. Uh, so next question, what do you Mohit? I think uh, sort of Porter has used data uh, and customer insights to grow their business. Uh, would love to share, like understand what stories and case studies you have how Porto has been able to do this successfully. Right. So, uh, Rick, uh, you know, Porto is a tech first business, right? So we really uh, generate a lot of billions of data points every day and we store all of them. And a lot of what we do is basically being driven by the this powerful data engine that we have been able to build internally over the period of time, right? So we'll give you a couple of examples quickly as to how we have, uh, you know, used uh, this data right so for example when the pandemic hit us and everybody would remember that there was no 
there was complete lockdown in india uh, and there was no goods movement which was happening right for a business like us it could be a very difficult situation to be in because you're in the move in, in the business of delivering goods right but then uh, we went back to the desk uh, you know collected a lot of data internally met a lot of customers over phone zoom and all of that and understood that what has happened is that a new kind of requirement has come up uh, wherein delivery to home is not now relevant only for let's say the swiggy zomato or the amazon flipkart of the world right i mean everybody is now delivering to home right uh, and of course this was this uh, this data was done over surveys and couple of other uh, data point that we were seeing internally in terms of how the orders is moving how the sessions are moving and all of that and then we put all of this together and we realized that there is a need to actually uh, you know uh, Uh, launch a new category altogether so earlier porter till 2020 was only a trucking company we used to move goods from one place to another using the trucks that we had right and but then with that insight we realized that uh, delivery to home or micro movement of goods have also become uh, very important and that is the time when we started uh, uh, to think about seriously getting into the two wheeler business as well because the micro movement has become important right i did not touch upon the micro movement uh, element but what was happening at that time was that a lot of people the buying power had gone down and people were purchasing goods in a smaller uh, cat, uh, uh, volume and hence the whole whole idea of uh, uh, you know micro movement also came in so with the micro movement and the and the and the home delivery coming in we realized that there is an opportunity to launch an entire two wheeler offering and that is when we came up with the two wheeler offering with all of these two put together and it has been one of the uh, uh, best success stories that we have had in so far right now two wheeler commands a fairly large share of our revenue and to be able to do that in one and a half year has been a uh, critical uh, success story for us and what it has also done is we have been talking about the brand trust right i mean when earlier the photo was synonymous with just the trucks now we will have realized over that period of time that we just don't do trucks we are able to move goods from one place to another whatever it may be at the right cost right another story again is an insight that uh, you know when we were again mining our data we realized that hey a lot of our users are actually using trucks for moving their houses right and it's not really a very seamless experience for them because uh, you know a lot of people are not really especially in india not open to the diy kind of concept right where you book in a truck and you just load your uh, uh, goods and you move from one place to another so we realized that a lot of people actually uh, want to uh, move their entire house and don't want to really do it by themselves which is the which was which was earlier the case because they had to just do all the loading and loading by themselves right and that is the time when we realized that there is an opportunity to build a whole platform of sorts Uh, which is when we launched our packers and movers offering as well now with porter packers and movers offering of course there were always the uh, large players of the world the agarwal the leos and all of them but they were at super expensive so now with porter packers and movers you can actually just shift your house in 5000 rupees within the city right that's how uh, that's how easy it is and it's really about just going on the app just entering few of the details and doing it uh, and within a day or two i mean we we are able to shift your house in as less than 3 hours if you give us a request in the morning we'll shift your house in the evening that's how fast we have become over the period of time so all of this has happened because of the and i can go on and all with multiple stories of sorts as to how we have used the data to kind of really, really bring things together to deliver a seamless customer experience and uh, uh, you know to be able to, have been able to build that brand trust of sorts that we are becoming synonymous with the logistics now uh, but these are the, these are some of the examples and how we have continuously mined data to launch new offerings grow the business deliver better customer experience and so on and so forth i think mohit you've elaborated a very important point that consumers are giving us data but a lot of companies are not fast enough to react so understanding what the consumer needs and reacting quickly and whether it's going to two wheelers or Moving homes, like you mentioned, five thousand rupees. I shifted from the sixth floor to the second floor, and the amount of stress that I went through in the shift 
if it could be done for less than 5000 rupees i would have done it myself from just one floor to the other floor because this is a shifting process you have to be so careful <laughs> because you can get sort of uh, uh, reminded about all the things you did wrong in that shifting process so i think this would have been a wonderful experience if i had known about it earlier uh, so over to you somashree i think godrej has built one of the most trusted brands and continue to maintain that trust for almost 100 plus years right so would love to know what goes into the minds of the culture of the organization to maintain and sort of build on this trust so uh, <clears throat> as i said i mean right in the beginning that keeping the ears to the ground is the most important skill that we have to have and we ensure that uh, all the ideas the the cycle from the product idea to actual execution to the ground is is not a huge uh, you know time taking cycle just to give you an example during covid as i said we had innovations coming up and new product launches within 3 months we actually had launched around 40 skus now any fmcg company you ask i mean launching that kind of just one product will take you that kind of time so it just speaks volumes about the capability that godrej as a company has be it understanding the consumer need be it having an r&d backup who can actually deliver on the proper quality of the product at the price be it our supply chain which actually can, has the capacity to you know garner that kind of product or the relations where they can get into p2p so agility in our case is extreme key across functions the second thing is i mean you know we encourage encourage our team members to be you know constantly and it's across uh, uh, across functions that they have to constantly keep going to the market they have to constantly you know keep speaking to the consumers across prop strata keep speaking to the retailers and you know some of the most amazing intelligent insights have actually come from consumers um, and retailers you know they are because retailers are actually the people who constantly interact with consumers and the first place where you get to know whether things are working or not or if there's a need gap actually is when you get the time to have that discussion with the retailers so some of these things are uh, the ones that we really really follow the other virtue that godrej has is uncompromising quality for example i mean in times like this when there is super amount of inflation be it crude be it oil prices and most of the products are using these as raw material even at this time there is zero compromise on quality even if it means that the profit uh you know at for a short period of time you have to take a hit or you have to pass on some level of cost to the consumer that is something that has been held true and for the last 100 years we have ensured that there has been no compromise on the quality and which is the reason why you know the trust is built so well, absolutely and i think so she like the example that you gave of launching something which is one third the price it could have easily been half the price and you would have obviously made more yeah. profit but at that point and the need of the hour was hygiene it was something to do with helping the country and i think for brands to maintain that level of trust they have to feel that the brand is going out of the way to help them and i think launching something at one third the price is a clear demonstration of how you build trust with consumers so and i sorry i just wanted to add that just to tell you the kind of quality we stand for the synthol that you saw you know with vinod khanna on the horse back you know that that particular soap that you had the quality then and quality now after so many years is absolutely the same and yes completely agree i mean for us it's more important to serve the consumers at the price that they can afford it and go deep into the pop strata that is most important for us yeah although i remember it as preeti zinta rather than vinod khanna Oh, that's because you are jealous. I just put it to that. <laughs> okay, so Ritika Simran, one quick thing. I do have a list of questions, but is there any questions on the audience? Uh, keeping in time in mind, we would love to cover some of the audience questions. But I can continue with my questions. Uh, oh, yeah. you can continue with your questions while we uh, look at the chat report and get to the questions from the okay. audience. Sounds good. So Shridhar, uh, I think uh, the world is moving to Web 3.0, and I think it's going to impact the world of advertising, marketing, 
even the omni channel very very uh, if it, like sort of exponentially in the very very near future would love to know <clears throat> what initiatives salesforce is taking in this web 3.0 world sure vivek yeah web 3 is uh, definitely the the new shiny object in the tech world right um, you know but before we get into the details uh, i just want to establish a basic definition right which is uh, think of web 3 as a a decentralized internet, you know, essentially built on the foundation of, you know, blockchain, right? So that's a very, you know, simple way of, you know, looking at what Web3 could be. So this obviously, you know, opens up, you know, lots of uh, possibilities, uh, new forms of ownership of uh, data and content. Uh, content creators will, you know, own the IP and they will get to actually realize uh, revenue even in secondary sales and so on, right? Uh, there are going to be new forms of uh, collaboration because it is decentralized by definition, uh, hopefully it will not be just controlled by two or three large uh, tech behemoths as we see today in the web two world, right? So we'll see how that goes, uh, which means that, you know, there's gotta be a lot of collaboration that will happen between, you know, different uh, parties and entities and so forth. Um, it also provides very exciting, you know, perpetual revenue possibilities, especially for content and IP creators, uh, because of the fact that it is more easy to establish you know, who owns that content and uh, whoever, you know, has a transaction on that content is going to get, you know, paid because of the smart contracts that are going to enforce, you know, these rules on, you know, Web3, right? Um, and there is also this, you know, very interesting concept of, you know, digital scarcity, right? Uh, that is a big problem in Web2. I can create a painting or something and, you know, there is just myriad ways to, with all the protection that you can put in, you can still copy it, you can abuse it and so on and so forth. Whereas it's going to be a lot more harder to do it on, you know, Web3. And therefore that scarcity is what is actually going to drive the demand for certain products and so forth, right? So those are some very exciting possibilities. Uh, we are already aware of, you know, some uh, very well-known things that are coming up. Obviously, cryptocurrency is one that's gaining a lot of attention. Uh, NFTs is again really big today. Um, Metaverse is again, you know, becoming very popular. But there are also other things like, for example, a DAO or a decentralized you know, autonomous organization, which is essentially an organization that is you know, built by a, a community of people uh, with a common purpose, right? So they all get together and say, I'm passionate about a particular topic and they establish you know, certain rules and uh, it, it's, it's controlled really by the community, not by one single you know, corporation as we see today. And then the extension of that is what we call as you know, DAPs or uh, DApps sometimes. Uh, which are decentralized, you know, apps, which is nothing but a UI, but it's run on a, you know, a smart contract and a, and a blockchain foundation, right? So all of these things are exciting and, you know, a lot of, uh, it, it's spawning a lot of, you know, new opportunities, new revenue models. A couple of, you know, interesting examples that I can point out is uh, what Nike did, you know, they're very active in this, uh, you know, Web3 space. They've actually acquired a, a virtual sneaker band called it's, it's actually spelled as RTFKT, like artifact. And it's just nothing but a community of people who are passionate about, you know, whom we call as, you know, sneaker heads. And they are actually going to design a sneaker for uh, Nike, right? So that's, uh, you know, something that they're doing already. Um, and then Time Magazine, you know, is another good example. They, they dropped a set of, you know, NFTs uh, in partnership with a company or a, or a program called the Robotos, which is nothing but a you know, an animated TV program with lots of, you know, robot characters, but they took those characters and created, you know, digital twins of them and have made them available to the larger public, you know, who are all like, you know, raging fans of this, you know, particular show, right? So lots of different ways of, you know, earning money and so forth, but I guess it also benefits the, the creators of, you know, this IP and uh, content. Now coming to Safeway, you know, we look at this as a logical extension to all the digital transformation work that we are already doing in the current you know, web two world, if you will, right? Uh, we're just gonna extend that to the customer worse. Uh, we understand that new customer identities will emerge. So going back to what I was saying earlier about the customer data platform, you know, an NFT backed or a web three backed identity could become that, you know, universal or master ID for customers, right? So that could become an umbrella ID for your uh, web two IDs or logins and profiles as well as, you know, web three. But once I get connection to that, you know, Web3 ID, then it opens up all, all these other possibilities. So we are trying to incorporate that into some of our products. But, you know, and then we also have a trailblazer community. 
uh, which is you know a ecosystem of you know developers and other people who work on the Salesforce you know platform, uh, and you know nothing could be better than a a Web three centric community because this is a true community. The only difference is that you know Salesforce as a company owns that brand or whatever, but in the Web three world, the trailblazers themselves will own that, right? And imagine you know rewarding them with you know tokens and other forms of currency. Which they could actually go and trade and you know use it for any other purpose. Wouldn't that be you know fantastic, right? So we are doing things like that. But the most exciting thing is you know we founded a thing called Web3 Studio, uh, which is going to bring together all these efforts. Uh, there are going to be you know thought leadership uh, provided to companies. Uh, we're going to have strategic partnerships with uh, you know Web3 native brands and so forth. Uh, we are also going to give them an opportunity to build products that are you know Web3 centric you know on the platform. So this is how you know we are looking at it. Uh, really, nothing, not really a huge drastic change. Uh, we continue to keep our you know focus on customer experience, but we just extend that to the you know sort of the metaverse or the customer goes here. Right. Yeah. Looking forward to this, Sridhar, because I think I've invested in nine companies in the creator economy space and very excited about Web 3.0. And I okay. feel that Salesforce kind of company they can provide the infrastructure required for a lot of ideas to get sort of a SaaS offering can help creation of millions of companies in the web 3.0 space so it'll also awesome to hear about that over to you bhavna i think you're back so it's yeah, yeah. sure so, uh, today, uh, basically uh, you know there's an audience question which has come in and i know that we're extending on the time of the panel so we'll maybe uh, allocate around two minutes to that uh, there's a question from apoorva vivek uh, who asked that when personalization is imperative and there are varying contexts for different brands how does a trusted brand maintain consistency in messaging and purpose? So would uh, Vivek, any of your panelists would just like to take a take on it? Because we've got hardly a couple of minutes on that. Yeah, I think probably Deepa, would you like to take? Uh... Deepa? Sure, sure, I'll take that. It's, it's a complex uh, question. It's a very important question. Uh, right. I think if you're talking about consistency in the context of personalization, it comes down to ensuring that you really know your customer very, very well in right. each and every interaction, right? So it's not, it's no longer enough to know your customer by demographic or behavior. You have to know them by demographic, behavior, psychographic, modes of doing business, and they're different avatars in different modes of doing business. For example, if I'm walking into a Starbucks store, I might behave very differently from when I'm ordering in uh, from you know, one of the apps or I'm you know, doing a mobile order and pay. Um, I think the other part of the question uh, was on purpose. Uh, uh, and I would just like to say, like, in my belief, people have become far more conscious about purpose in the last couple of years because we're all feeling very vulnerable and we're all digging deep and really evaluating what the world means for us, et cetera. And I do think customers are going to look at brands very strongly, which resonate and have a strong sense of purpose and resonate with their purpose. So it's going to be questions asked about what are you doing for the community? What are you doing for the environment? What are you doing for sustainability? What are you doing for your own people? And I think over here, authenticity is so important, right? Because customers are sharp. If they don't see you following up on your rhetoric with actions, it's all then just going to be plain rhetoric. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, reply, Deepa. And uh, definitely a lot of us uh, do love uh, the brand uh, you're associated with. Uh, so with that, uh, Vivek, also before we conclude, I'd just like to put in a personal uh, question from my side. Your book is coming up. Uh, you know, our viewers would uh, love to know more about it. If you could just allocate, you know, a tidbit of what's uh, coming up in the book uh, for our viewers, please. Sure. So the book is called Happiness is a Muscle. Happiness during, is a Muscle. Wow. So during COVID, I realized that I think happiness is a choice we make. Right. Uh, it doesn't happen automatically. You have to work on it. So there are certain things universal that everybody must do to be happier. So my book doesn't promise making you happy, but it makes you, it promises you it can make you happier. There is a difference. So there are certain things everybody must do. So sleep adequately, exercise, meditate, be generous, etc. But how do you actually sustain happiness depends on what kind of beliefs you have. So it's almost like a Jim Collins flywheel between actions and beliefs. So you hear a lot of beliefs. Some of them empower you. And then some of them are limiting you. So if you can adopt the beliefs that empower you and sort of take out from your life the beliefs that are limiting you, then the flywheel starts turning and you become happier. So everybody has a baseline. Something mm -hmm. positive will happen. The baseline, the 
it'll go up or go down, but you come and settle down at your baseline, whatever the baseline is. But if you can work on it on a day to day basis with the choice to be made to be happier, then your 70, the baseline can become 71, 72. So when up and downs happen, you come back to 72 instead of coming back to 70. And it's all personal, right? So somebody could right. be 50, somebody could be 90, doesn't matter. But the thing is that if you can work on it, like how you work on building muscle by nutrition and exercise, one must build their happiness by working on the actions they do and the beliefs they have. So basically, this is the purpose. Uh, my purpose in life is to make 100 million people happier. And book is one of the vehicles that I'm going to use. But again, the, the goal is that in order to learn something better, you try to teach it. And writing this book has increased my knowledge quotient of the topic of happiness significantly more than what it was before I wrote the book. Right, Vivek. So uh, uh, cheers to more happier times is all I can say. And definitely going to grab a copy of that. Uh, thank you once again uh, to all our panelists for your valued time. And uh, we'd love to reconnect with you at another forum. But for now, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Vivek, for uh, Thank you. the facilitation. Thank you so much.